Okay, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Charlotte, and I want to welcome you to today's Tech Talk, Advanced Kubernetes Lessons Learned from Building a Managed Service. Before we begin, we have a couple of housekeeping items to go over. Everyone will be muted for the Tech Talk, so please type any questions you may have as we go along into the Q&A panel. You can also use the raise hand feature located at the bottom of your screen, and we'll unmute you and you can ask your questions live should you prefer. We'll try to answer questions as we go along and then answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. We're also live streaming this currently to YouTube, so the video will be made available there on YouTube after the presentation is done. We're recording Tech Talk as well, and we'll send it to everyone via email following the session. Now that we've taken care of that, thank you again for joining us today for this Tech Talk. It's presented by Hussein Babel and moderated by Vladimir Schreiner. Hussein is building Hazelcast Cloud to provide Hazelcast Cluster as a service with extensive features. He's an AWS certified DevOps professional building highly scalable real-time systems with Spring Boot, Kubernetes, Docker, Prometheus, event-based systems, and hybrid cloud. He'll be joined today by our moderator, Vladimir Schreiner. Vladimir is a technical product manager for Hazelcast with an engineering background, master's degree in computer science, and deep expertise in stream processing and real-time data pipelines. He's the product guy behind the Hazelcast Jet streaming engine. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to you, Hussein, to get us started. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Hussein. Hope uh, you see my screen all. Um, in this session, basically, I will try to explain you what is actually the following items. Uh, basically, we are trying to automate everything related to microservices in a Kubernetes um, environment. Uh, this session will contain basically two phases. The first phase will be about the Kubernetes itself, and uh, the second part will be about how we deploy our microservices into this environment in order to manage our Hezgas cloud and uh, components. So um, when you have a look at the Kubernetes overview, actually it is an open source platform for managing the contain containerized workload and services. So whatever we implement in um, our system, actually they are all containers. So Kubernetes is for managing all of them. Um, if you just decided to use uh, Kubernetes, you can use a managed version of that. So in Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, and other cloud providers, DigitalOcean, you can use that. And also if you have an on-prem environment, you can use KubeSpray or related technologies in order to uh, deploy your Kubernetes in your um, data center. So uh, when you use Kubernetes, actually mostly you will focus on your uh, product rather than the architectural stuff. So let's say that you are building a system, um, a managed service. At that time, if you are planning to uh, provide a service to multiple customers, you need to have something, uh, some isolated environment, right? Um, when you use Kubernetes, you can use this one, you can do handle that one very easily. So um, let's say that you have a couple of environments for your needs. It can be dev environment, staging, prod, uh, they are all for different purposes. And um, in order to isolate those environments, you can do something like this. You can create separate Kubernetes clusters. It can be cluster one, two, and three. And you can assign this environment into these uh, different clusters. So um, it seems very secure, but uh, at the end, you may have some operational cost on this because you need to manage all of these clusters at the same time. In second one, you can do you can have a one giant cluster, Kubernetes cluster, and then you can put your environment inside it, and it is called namespace in Kubernetes world, and you can isolate them by using some rules inside the Kubernetes. Uh, the main best practice here is even you have multiple Kubernetes cluster or a single one. Um, if, and if you are a new Kubernetes learner, most probably you will deploy everything into default namespace, which, is, which may not be a good practice on this. So uh, let's say that you are deploying everything into default namespace, and at the end of the day, you will see there are lots of things inside your default namespace. So uh, better to create different namespaces and then def deploy your uh, applications into these specific namespaces. 
in the example, you can see there is monitoring microservice and the worker namespace, and uh, you can deploy your monitoring related technologies into monitoring namespace, your applications into microservice, the service ones. And also if you have cron jobs, for example, you can deploy them into worker names. So let's say that you are working with the microservices, you can switch to that namespace and do whatever you want. Um, if you have Kubernetes cluster, you will use kubectl very frequently. So um, uh, I will introduce you two, techno two tools here. One is uh, kubecontext and another is kubeNS. So they are actually inside the same uh, GitHub repository. You can check it. And um, kubecontext is for managing your Kubernetes context. That means if you have multiple Kubernetes clusters, you can manage them. I mean, you can switch between those clusters by using kubecontext. And also kubeNS for um, managing your namespace stuff. In the example, you will see uh, when you say kubecontext, you can see different Kubernetes clusters contexts and you can switch them between them very easily. In Kubernetes, it has same strategy. So you can switch between namespaces uh, in a very easy way. So if you just wanted to do that by using kubectl, you need to have uh, used these long comments and it is very hard to uh, remember that comments. We talk about Kubernetes clusters, but right now, let's say that you have one giant cluster or you may have different clusters in different region, but what about providing services to outside by using the same infrastructure, right? Um, if I try to describe this multi-tenancy stuff, actually there is one Kubernetes cluster and you are using different namespaces for each customer with strict network policies. So, uh, there is customer A, B, C, and according to Kubernetes world, actually they are all namespaces for me. So uh, whatever I have uh, for these customers, they are all uh, inside these namespaces. You can um, handle this multi-tenancy in theory in two ways, the native Kubernetes way or multi-tenancy way programmatic approach. In the first way, uh, there are a couple of um, resources in Kubernetes that you can use. Uh, the one of them is resource quotas, but you need to enable this one uh, during the inside the API server. And the second one is network policy. So in order to network uh, see the capabilities of network policy, you need to check your CNI plugin. So when you install Kubernetes cluster, uh, you have some options to install network plugins. Inside this network plugin documentations, you can see all of the capabilities inside uh, for, for, for the network policies. Let's say that you have a name set that customers equal to a namespace, but uh, I have customer 1443. So it may have inside this namespace, they may have pod services or PVCs, the pod uh, minimal deployable unit, the services in order to expose this pod to outside and also uh, volume related stuffs. You can restrict this, all of these resources inside the customer namespace. For example, in here, you can see there is a definition. And in this definition, uh, you are saying, okay, there is a resource quota. And by this quota, you may have one persistent volume claim. You may have three load balancer. You, you cannot expose any node port to outside. So you can define this kind of steps. And when you deploy this one, actually, and try to, when you, uh, reach the limit, you will see, you will get an exception in Kubernetes level. And when it comes to network policy, so if you have multiple namespaces inside your Kubernetes cluster, you will see that um, you can connect from one namespace to another. So it is very normal, but you will see, I am saying that this monitoring namespace um, the, I have deployed a network policy into C123, which is the customer's name, namespace. And here I'm saying that uh, monitoring namespace can access any pod inside any namespace. So why I am doing this one? Because I have a monitoring system in a central place and these monitoring components can collect some metrics from every customer. So this is a, this is a basic rule for this. And also uh, let's say that but the customer wants to reach the outside, right? There's the internet from your namespace. Of course, I will allow the customers, but 
uh, think about I am inside the AWS environment and I should uh, block user to access this API because this is very uh, important API, which is the AWS metadata API. Uh, you don't want to uh, somehow expose your metadata of the EC2 instances to the outside. So uh, here um, in a managed service, um, you may have uh, two different platforms. One is control plane and another is data plane. In data plane, actually you have your technology that you provide to customers. In control plane, you have some uh, control mechanisms like microservices, cron jobs, some tools. Uh, but you have clusters, right? But uh, if you increase the cluster size and if you deploy lots of microservices, cron jobs, et cetera, you have lots of customers and you need to have very good monitoring system in order to not stress in production environment. When you search for a monitoring in Kubernetes environment, you will see this very basic diagram. And in this diagram, it has uh, Prometheus at the core and it has some different components like push gateway, alert manager, and some notification system. Prometheus is for uh, collecting metrics from uh, well-known sources like C Advisor or other, any other technologies. Also, you can use your custom exporter to feed Prometheus uh, for your custom metrics. In order to deploy uh, Prometheus, you can use Prometheus operator. So you can go search for the Prometheus operator and um, uh, you can install this uh, by using Helm command. When you say Helm install the Prometheus operator, basically it will install Prometheus and related core components. Plus you will have some predefined dashboards, Grafana dashboard for this. For example, what is the pod resources? disk status, cluster status, et cetera, you will have lots of information on this. But what about visualizations? Because you installed a, um, a technology, but what about UI part? In visualization, mostly we are using Grafana. And as you can see, I can see the clusters dashboard. And I selected one of my Kubernetes cluster and I can see pod usages, CPU reserve, uh, and also some namespace, namespace uh, limits, number of pods, et cetera, you may have lots of information inside this. So I haven't configured this dashboard because it comes as a building uh, from the um, Prometheus operator. If you have some um, uh, cron jobs, you can also see how many cron jobs succeeded or failed in your system. You see another one, which is microservices, but this one is the custom one. So I search for the plugin uh, in the Grafana community uh, dashboards. And this is for managing my microservice environment. Basically, I can see some uh, JVM insights because it is very important on our side. We are using Spring. You can see the garbage collection activities, et cetera. So according to these values, basically you can create your own alerts. So let's say that if you have lots of uh, memory threshold activities, maybe you can alert your um, IT guys or SRE guys in order to handle this one as soon as possible. In the example, uh, it is for uh, detecting the idle cluster. So since we are managing a multi-tenant environment, uh, if you have an idle cluster inside system, of course, which is a free one, we notify ourselves. And also it triggers some webhooks in order to stop customer cluster. If you ever use Heroku before, it is very same, like uh, same as the Heroku doing. What about monitoring the multiple cluster? Because uh, for example, we deploy our system into multiple regions and we, we, we needed to uh, manage this one at the same time. So we are, uh, the, the, there, is a, there is a stuff which is called Prometheus Federation. It is for managing multiple Kubernetes clusters. In our case, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, when you have a look at this example, you will see, um, this is the Prometheus Federation config. And I am saying that, okay, I will have three more clusters. Could you please go these targets and collect the metrics? And Prometheus does this operation for you. And uh, when you have a look at the dashboard, you will see the metrics coming from the different Kubernetes clusters. And until this point, whatever we did, actually all for showing this dashboard, simple dashboard. So. Uh, we deploy Hazelcast clusters by using uh, the Kubernetes pods, deployments, et cetera. We are collecting metrics by using Prometheus. We have written custom exporters uh, and we are calling our Prometheus APIs in order to populate this, this dashboard. That's all. 
So, so um, may, I, the, may I stop you for a while? So uh, is Prometheus the, the only means that you use for monitoring or there are any other tools that, that you use? Um, Prometheus is the only one for our system because uh, we are trying to, we, we try to find a de facto solution for the entire system because otherwise the, uh, if you introduce another monitoring component, it will introduce another uh, operational cost on this. So even even the application specific metrics go to Prometheus. Yes, that's correct. So basically, we write our custom exporters, and that exporters collect these metrics and send to the Prometheus. For example, we are collecting metrics from management center and push it to the central one. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, in a, let's say that we are about to deploy our application, move, expose our application to outside. Uh, if we wanted to do this in AWS environment, um, the first thing you need to do is just uh, the Nginx ingress. So if you deploy an application and during the expose operation, you may select different kinds of service like node port, load balancer, et cetera. But uh, if you select load balancer for every microservices and if you have hundreds of microservices, you will have a huge cost on uh, the cloud provider side. So instead of exposing different load balancer for each service, you may use Nginx ingress. So when you deploy Nginx ingress, it will create a load balancer for you, only once. And then uh, you can deploy your ingress rules in order to route traffic from the load balancer to the specific service on the background. So uh, here in AWS, I, e, Nginx Ingress creates a load balancer and I created an entry in root 53 in order to map my domain name to the specific load balancer URL as a CNA and that's all. So uh, in, in Ingress rule, in order to manage this Ingress traffic, you, you can use this notation. So let's say that I just wanted to make a route to product service. You can say this one, okay. When you make a request to example.com and with a context path, which is product, it will automatically proxy to the product service. So this service name is the service name inside the Kubernetes environment. And of course it will use the 8080 port. So in high level, you can see this one, the request comes to the DNS uh, in the root 53. It points to load balancer as a C name. And of course, Nginx ingress is uh, responsible for routing this traffic to the specific services. What about microservices? So in the um, old days, whenever you try to deploy a monolithic application to production environment, it may take something like minutes or maybe hours, even you change a small title of this. But when you move to microservice architecture, you uh, decompose your monolith to my multiple services, but at the end, you may have this one because you end up with hundreds of microservices, but you, you don't know how to manage all of these uh, services in one environment. So uh, you need to apply, of course, the microservice architectures, microservice architectures in order to solve uh, this um, memory problem. One sec. I guess Hussein's baby wants to be involved in his tech talk as well. <laughs> it wants to be a YouTube star already. <laughs> the new dynamic of everybody working remotely. Uh, sorry for that, insistently I tried to open door, but somehow, yeah, we can continue. Um, yeah, in order to solve this kind of problems, you need to apply your, uh, some best practices to microservice architecture. Um, uh, the, the first way is to microservices are like humans, right? So you need to have uh, some proper language. In here, you can uh, analyze the maybe rest, uh, rest principle in order to communicate your services between each other. So in rest, uh, maybe you have heard about this one. Uh, in Leonard Richardson maturity model, there is a level of rest uh, steps. So in the first step, it is something like soft services. In the second one, Level one, you have resources. Basically you have endpoints, but you are using same HTTP methods for every operation. In the third level, you have HTTP words, something like post for creating, patch for partial update, etc. In very top, you may have something like 
uh, navigatable resources inside the response. Let's say that you just wanted to see the details of uh, GitHub uh, repository, and you can see the links for navigating the issues, authors, etc. These kind of things. And um, of course, um, in order to communicate between uh, services, services, you you can use some something like client methodology, right? Here. You can use the client code generation. Of course, you can do this one by using Swagger and Swagger CodeGen. But of also, you may use different kinds of technologies. Like if you are in Java domain, you can use Fane clients. So basically, uh, implement an interface and whatever the uh, uh, method signatures here acts like a client code inside your system. And uh, in Swagger CodeGen, actually, you define this is a simple configuration for Spring Boot project. You just define configuration and you will have these two URLs. The first one for API documentation, it automatically generates the API documentation for you. And the second one is for your API spec. And in order to generate client code, you just provide your API spec and it will automatically create your client code by using this language, which is Spring, this to a specific folder. So whenever you deploy some service into your environment, you can just trigger another job to generate your client code automatically and push it to the artifact repository. So this, you may automatically handle your client uh, libraries. So what, what, how can we deploy this one into Kubernetes environment? In, in here, you can see a different project, which is the Golang. And basically I have my code base, plus I have a Kubernetes directory for deployment and service, right? And here, when you have a look at the deployment and service, you will see uh, the deployment definition. It contains some uh, Docker image URL. You may have some environment variables. And also you can say, okay, I will have three instances in this deployment. And also in order to route traffic, uh, you may use service. And here I am saying that, okay, uh, this service is for event service. And then I am exposing this service to outside as a load balance. So you can define this one. And the communication between deployment and services um, uh, handled by the selectors. You, you see here, the selector is app is equal to event app uh, that exists inside the deployment. So uh, in, um, in a specific scenario, basically we clone project a CD into it and we apply the Kubernetes folder and that's it because everything related to Kubernetes exists under the Kubernetes folder. What about the sensitive variables, sensitive information? So in order to inject some sensitive information to the application, you can... Here I am saying that my DB password is equal to this one, most probably coming from the Jenkins credentials. And um, in your application, instead of using the static, static value, key value, spring data, sorry, username, for example, the first one is the static one. And the second one, I am saying that my password coming from a secret, you can provide your secret here. Product service secret and the key is the DB password. What about deployment part? When you trigger a, a change in your system, basically, um, basically it triggers a Jenkins build in a simple scenario. You build, test and deploy a cloud provider maybe. So inside your Jenkins file, we do this one, build, test and deploy. and uh, we are automatically notifying ourselves in Slack in order to be proactive on this. And also in um, uh, building stuff, we basically build our images, uh, push it to the registry and then apply Kubernetes folder again. But uh, during the deployment, uh, we have three uh, uh, options here, rolling, canary and blue green deployment. Rolling update is the default one, which is uh, when you make a deployment, it will do it uh, one by one. And uh, when it comes to um, canary deployment, canary deployment, it is a bit different than the rolling upgrade. So you, you see there is a production version in here, in production in live environment. And I have a three replicas here. Let's say that you introduce a, a experimental feature, which is two one. So as you can see, one of them has three, another of them has one uh, replicas, but the labels are same. Whenever you make a request, actually the 75% of the request will go to the old version and the 25% of the request will go to the new version. And after a while, of course, you need to increase this portion. The replicas one will be two, three, 
and at the end you will have this two zero image in production environment of course you need to track your ex exceptions in the login central login tool so uh, what about blue green deployment which is the most expensive one so basically you have an, uh, a live environment and you have a complete duplicate of live environment in the another cluster and you deploy your uh, new features to second environment and then do some internal checks etc maybe you can expose this one to specific customers and after a while you can switch your route to new environment and that's all so the old one will be automatically deprecated hussein may i may i ask again uh, so you are mentioning deployment of new services and it expects that you can kind of upgrade the the parts of your application one by one but what if the yeah. old and a new version isn't has some state that is shared and that must must be changed as part of the upgrade okay so for the, for this kind of operation we are not doing a proper update instead of doing that we will introduce an api version so you need to somehow maintain these versions these two versions at the same time but uh, it is very critical part actually. If there is a share, so if there is a shared part, somehow you need to introduce a maintenance window. That's what we do inside our Hazelcast cloud. So if there is a critical change that needs to be shared, then we put our system into read-only mode. Uh, so you can read the information, but you cannot write any kind of things. And after the maintenance uh, finished, we enable the read-only uh, write again in order to uh, proceed our system. So okay, that's that how sense. we solve this uh, this problem. Yeah. You have lots of components, right? It's somehow you need to track it. So you introduce lots of logs. So we are using um, uh, cluster level logging here, the not first one, the second one. Basically, in every Kubernetes node, we have some agent, which is the node, um, which is the daemon set, and here. Uh, Flantpit, which is called Flantpit, Flantpit collect every log from the containers, and it. Uh, sends it to the log stash, the, the local log stash. And log stash sends this information as central logging system. As you can see here, uh, you can see different kind of technologies, but we are using Humio in our case. So basically when you sign up for Humio, it is a free version and it will provide a configuration to you, basically uh, in just token and the URL of the logging system. And when you install this one by using Helm chart, you will see every log will be shipped to the central logging management tool. So it can be uh, uh, ELK, gray log, et cetera. It can be everything, but at the end, they are using the same strategy. When it comes to um, uh, application monitoring system, you will see you need to carefully handle this APM and service mesh stuff. Um, you can use lots of uh, open source technologies for this. For example, um, Zipkin, and there's Jagger in order to uh, track your distributed tracing. But also, also there is some paid tools like New Relic App Dynamics, Dynatrace. In our case, uh, we are using um, Instana in order to track our system and then uh, provide a service mesh. So uh, as you can see, when I deploy Instana, it automatically creates a map or our, on our ent entire uh, architecture. You can see it is the AWS environment. And also I can see in my service mesh, which service is calling which other service. So uh, it is very critical information on our system. And also let's say that there is a problem inside system. There's a latency, et cetera. Okay, I, I, I uh, somehow alerted by this system. And uh, when I deep dive into the um, request, for example, I can see, okay, it goes to uh, service, shop service. It calls another uh, internal product search. And you see what there is an Elasticsearch dependency and there is a latency on this. Most probably there is a missing index or some uh, wrong index. So it introduced latency and you need to somehow fix this one. So it is very important to see the life cycle of the request inside the microservice environment. And also uh, you can automatically create incidents if there is a problem in your system, it is totally up to you. And uh, that's all on my side. So if you have any kind of question, you can use these links. Um, any questions? So I'm not seeing questions in a QA, Q Q and a uh, but I, I have a few. So you started started the whole presentation with the fact that when when you started, uh, you were designing 
think this as a solution that should run Kubernetes. And you mentioned that there are uh, options how to actu actually run the Kubernetes itself. You can either use your own on-premise deployment or a managed Kubernetes in a public, uh, public clouds. Is there any kind of design change or dependency or design decision that would be different uh, if you used on-premise Kubernetes or managed Kubernetes, or is this completely, completely the same? Uh, of course, there is some critical changes. For example, on your on-premise environment, you may not have automatic this load balancer system or some persistent volume stuff. So in AWS, you can easily create load balancer or you can create some uh, EBS volumes, right? Even the uh, central network file system. But in on-premise environment, you don't have an automatic solution, but you may have, um, there's a project which is called Metal B. Um, so you can install this one in your own premise in order to have a load balancer system because you, you may need it in your Kubernetes environment. And also you can use something like Rook or OpenEBS in order to have this distributed file system stuff. Because if your application keeps some state, you may need some persistent volume storage. And if you are on on-premise environment, you need to install these technologies in order to have same level with cloud providers and you on-premise environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get it. I mean, uh, on the same note, you, you mentioned that you are using uh, Instana for uh, for request tracking or for tracking, like for distributed tracing, which is, I guess, another managed service that, uh, service that's available in the Amazon Amazon stack. Is there any rule of the top based of the based on your experience when to use like managed service and when to use something that you build and manage yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first thing we are, uh, we, we, we always choose that if there's a managed version, we use it. But there are a couple of uh, criteria for this. First of all, it should be something like uh, uh, somehow uh, SOC2 compliant because we are trying to get this SOC2 certificate and everything we are, every third party we are using should be SOC2 compliant. And the second one is whatever we are using, it should be a bundled application. So and let's say that if I am using Instana for service mesh and I need to use, uh, how can I say that APM for, I, I am using APM, another company for APM, it will be bad. So if there is a product and it provides me the solution for everything, it is good for me. So service mesh APM, it is bundled. Uh, it is our criteria, but at the top level, we are trying to choose managed service as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But generally you prefer to have uh, the lowest possible number of, let's say third party vendors, although it's provided services. Yes. Okay, that yes. makes sense. Yes. Correct. And my maybe last question. So I was never really involved in building such a managed service. And I believe it's kind of novel experience for everybody. Uh, you outlined, quite a few differences that are significant. On the operational side of things, what was maybe the most surprising experience that you've get uh, operating such a solution? Uh, actually, there, there were lots of things. For example, in, in Hazelcast, the latest latency is very important, right? We are working with the milliseconds, et cetera. So when we first deployed Kubernetes clusters, uh, we, we had very, very huge latencies between uh, uh, Hazelcast and the client. So uh, we deep dive in this problem and saw that uh, it was about our network plugin. So we needed to change this network plugin. And we, we uh, tested at least three of them. So, and we concluded one of them, which is the Calico. And also we removed lots of components from the Kubernetes environment because every component we install inside Kubernetes, it always introduces a latency. So it is not acceptable by Hazelcast. So uh, it was very surprising for me. So it is very easy to install something in Kubernetes, but somehow you need to track it very carefully, especially in the performance side. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's, it's insightful. As I have said, there are not many people who have really that deep experience with building mm -hmm. like production work systems. On, on this technology. Hussein, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any question in either Q&A or in the 
YouTube channel. So with that being said, uh, I will thank you for today's talk. It was very insightful. And uh, I would like to also invite everybody for another talk, tech talk, which is, uh, which is coming in, in two weeks. Thank you for joining thank, and thank have you. a nice day. Bye-bye.